Let's begin reading here in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 18. I'm going to look at verses 12 through 17. I'll read that first. Then we'll look at that. And as is my normal method of teaching, I'll remind you of, of some of the things that have led up to this so that you have a, a better uh, understanding in the, in the event that you weren't with us last, uh, last week. I'll share with you a little bit about Corinth and things like that. And uh, then we'll move into the study. And in reality, I actually, when I have taught this in the past, I've, I've actually divided this, uh, this chapter so that the verses that I'm introducing right now uh, and a little bit further to verse 23 would have been taken as a single study. So I've combined both of these, uh, what would have been two studies, I've combined them into a single study. You're going uh, you're gonna to be seeing that and the approach I'm going to take. I'm especially going to, just letting you know in advance, I'm especially going to be looking at in a little more detail uh, verses 24 through 28 because we're going to be looking at... Uh, at a young man by the name of Apollos, and I chose to refer to this whole study as the key to greatness, but you'll see the reason why I chose to entitle it that when we begin to look at, uh, at this young man. So let's begin reading here in verse 12. I'll read verses 12 through 17. As I've mentioned, I'll give to you an introduction, remind you of a few things. We'll get into our study, and then the second portion uh, will uh, uh, look a little deeper at a young man, again, by the name of Apollos. So beginning at verse 12, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and your own law, Look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And, and he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. And so Paul has been on what has been referred to by theologians. He's been on what is referred to as his second missionary journey. And he's, he came to the city, a city by the name of Corinth. Now, Corinth as I've already mentioned to you, it was a, a city that was uh, around 40 miles or so uh, southwest uh, of, of the city of, of Athens. And it was a beautiful, beautiful city. It was a harbor city, if you will. It was commercially prosperous. It was well known at that time, filled with artists who worked with stone and metal, had a great number of orators, a great number of philosophers. It hosted uh, games that were rivals uh, rival games to the uh, Olympics. It was called the Isthmian Games. And the Isthmian Games had a musical as well as athletic competition. They were well known. They were well attended. Corinth had a temple that was dedicated to a Greek goddess. Her name is Aphrodite. And Aphrodite was associated with love and lust, with beauty and pleasure, passion and sex. She had 1,000 religious prostitutes who nightly seduced tourists and sailors. So the city was known for many things, including and especially its sexual degradation, its licentiousness, its debauchery. And so in the midst of such moral degradation and idolatry, a church had been planted. Now, Paul was an evangelist. He was a missionary. And he had been stirred up to preach, and the Spirit was compelling him to preach. And he was doing so in the synagogues in preaching that Jesus is Messiah. And so he was reasoning, he was preaching, and and the people weren't open to him, and they weren't open to what he was saying, and so they, they opposed, they resisted him, they, they blasphemed the things that he was saying, they rejected the gospel. And so this had prompted him to concentrate on reaching the Gentiles, because they were open to the message. He began to minister next door to the synagogue that had rejected him, and a man by the name of Justice, who was a Gentile, came to faith in Christ, opened the door for him. Now, after that, the synagogue ruler, a man by the name of Crispus, had come to faith. And that was a planting of the church in the city of Corinth. Now, in spite of the fruit that is being produced, Paul has become afraid. The Jews were in opposition, doing whatever they could to silence him. Now, in, in a city called Lystra, he had received stoning. He had been dragged out of the city. He had been left for dead. When he was in Philippi, he had been severely beaten with rods. He'd been put in jail. 
And antagonistic Jews have been following him from city to city. They've been stirring up the mobs. Now, when you look at uh, what is said concerning uh, the Apostle Paul, some of the things you read in Scripture uh, gives you some insight, though there are no descriptions that are full uh, for us to know exactly what he would have looked like and all. We know that by Scripture that he wasn't physically strong, and we know that he dealt with health issues. And it was even because of an illness that he had first gone and preached the, the gospel to the, the, the Galatians. We see that in Galatians 4.13. And, and he said in Galatians 4.15, the second portion of that verse, he said, I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me, which has caused commentators to say that he may have had, very well may have had an eye disease of some sort because he had said you'd have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. When he was writing his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 10, uh, that verse records that his opponent said his bodily presence is weak. So this was not a powerful figure. He wasn't somebody that would instantly cause you to say, what an appealing man. I wonder what he has to say. He wasn't physically strong. He dealt with health, health issues. As a matter of fact, One ancient writer, when speaking of him and describing him, simply said he was a small man with crooked legs. So he wasn't a good dancer. So Paul didn't have a lot of testimony that he was somebody that you would naturally feel the inclination to listen to. Now, why am I telling that? Because you're going to see later on a man by the name of Apollos that actually would have been somebody you would have listened to. So he was constantly on the move. The stress and the fatigue was was constant, was consistent. Again, he's not a young man. It's estimated that at this time he probably could have been around 50 years of age. And so the pressures and the threats had brought him to the place where he had fear. And it was at that time that the Lord had spoken to him in a vision and had encouraged him. He said, no one will attack you to hurt you. I have many people in this city. In other words, many are hungry for salvation. Many are open for you to preach to them and And so that he did. He did so unhindered for 18 months. And that's where we're picking up our our story here. And so as this is taking place, verse 12, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And so that basically gives us a date for when this is taking place because history records when he was the proconsul. This is taking place somewhere around the year 53. Now, when you look at ancient maps of of this area, you have Macedonia to the north and and Achaia to the south. And it was normally divided, at least as in reference, it would be divided into those two sections. But when they're speaking here of Achaia, it's speaking to the fact that that was really a unified in this particular context, it was a unified thing. It was uh, saying that he governs the Macedonian king. He governs it all. He's governing north and south. And so he's a man of political power. So it's at this time that the Jewish opposition is rising up against Paul. And they're trying to get him uh, to kick Paul out of the city. That's what it's saying here when it says that they brought Paul to the judgment seat, saying this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, the law that they're speaking of is uh, contrary to uh, more than likely Roman, Roman law, uh, or it could be something that uh, is interpreted, and you'll see this in a minute, as the uh, Jewish law. But in fact, they're saying that he is, he is preaching contrary to Roman law. That's what their appeal is. Now, that's not a new charge. Something similar had already been alleged when he was there in Philippi. And as we've seen in Acts chapter 16, Verses 20 and 21, it says there that these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. And so they're saying that he's breaking Roman law. Now, what would the crime be? Well, Rome had banished Jews from the city of Rome, and this Jew has come here causing problems. You see, the Jewish faith, Judaism, was tolerated. But they're saying Paul is bringing a new religion here, one that's not recognized. So as that's being said, notice verse 14. It says, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. 
for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And so Paul's about to preach. I want you to notice something. Notice in verse 14, it says when Paul was about to open his mouth. Now, for me, just upon reading it, it would say to me, Paul was about to just talk, to share, to speak, right? But the phrase, open his mouth, has been used in a different sense earlier. You actually saw that when Philip was preaching to, to an Ethiopian eunuch and giving the gospel. As you remember, it's found in chapter 8 of Acts, that the, uh, this eunuch, this high uh, official, had left Jerusalem and was on his way home. And Philip had seen him reading scripture and had asked him if he understood what he read. And in Acts 8, 34 and 35, the eunuch answered Philip and said, I, I ask you, of whom does a prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And that's what Paul is about to do. He's not just going to respond it's a phrase that would give to us insight that he was about to proclaim. He was about to speak about Jesus Christ. But before he could open his mouth to preach, Gallio cuts him off. Now notice in verse 14, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And this actually is saying an awful lot. Gallio is making it clear that he, as a, as a government official, is not going to judge a religious difference. I'm a civil judge, he's saying. My responsibility is related to criminal activity. He speaks of wrongdoing. He speaks of crimes. Wrongdoing speaks of open crimes, like strong arm robbery or a physical assault, something like that, that's an open crime. When he says wicked crimes, wicked crimes are a different kind of crime. It's, a, it's the hidden crimes like fraud or shoplifting, vandalism, things that other people may not notice, but they're still crimes uh, nonetheless. So wrongdoing is open, wicked crimes is hidden. He's simply saying, as a government official, I am not here to, to judge on religious matters. I'm not an expert, he's saying, on the subtleties and nuances of, of philosophy. Now, by the tone of his words, and, it's, and you have to read it this way, if it's a question of words and names of your own law, look to it yourselves. I don't want to be a judge of such matters. He's making it very clear. I don't have any kind of regard for your religious beliefs. I have no time for what he, as a, an official, would say, for your superstition. I don't have any time for that. By the way he's speaking, it reminded me as I was preparing the study, it reminded me of a government official by the name of Pontius Pilate and how that when Jesus was standing before him and speaking to him, Pilate began to speak in response and, and John recorded it in John 18 verses 37 and the first portion of verse 38 where it says that Pilate said to Jesus, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I've come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? It's a similar thought. I don't have time for your religious questions, for your philosophical questions. I'm not suited to be a judge concerning those things. Those are things you need to take care of. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not interested in your religious differences. And you can see he's irritated. They're irritated that they brought this up to him in the first place. You petty religious people and your trivial arguments get on my nerves, is what he's saying. This isn't a civil matter, as long as it doesn't provoke an actual crime to occur. Now, you have differences of belief. You have differences of opinion. If you want to hold on to your own beliefs, I'm not interested in them. If a civil law has been violated, well, I'd have reason to listen to you. But the fact is, no civil law has been broken. Notice verse 15, how he says, if it's a question of words and names and your own law. Those are important things that he's saying. He's breaking down the argument. 
If it's a question about words, the words would be speaking of the message of the gospel. It's a, if it's a question of names, it would be a question of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. If it's a question of your own law, it's a question regarding whether he fulfilled all that the law has to state concerning the way somebody is saved. And, and I am not qualified to dispute this or make a judgment concerning these things, words, names, or your own law. I don't want to judge you on such matters. I'm not interested in the argument. I'm not qualified to make a judgment. Settle this yourselves. Why are you bringing your concerns to a civil court? As a civil judge, I need to judge impartially. I don't want to hear this. But as a human being, he's closing his door of opportunity to hear the gospel. Because the greatest evangelist, the Apostle Paul, was prepared to give to him the gospel. And that's what he was about to do when it said Paul was about to open his mouth. Gallio, by your indifference and rejection, you have lost the opportunity of hearing the truth. You have lost the opportunity of hearing the gospel. A friend of mine in San Jose, Calvary Chapel Ministry in San Jose, had had his church open during the time when the government was stating that it needed to be closed. And uh, it created a great problem up in that area, and, and uh, Mike had been taken before a judge. And the judge wanted to hear his reasons for leaving a church open when California was mandating the closure of all churches. And so when he asked Mike to give a reason why he was doing this, Mike was given the opportunity to, to preach the gospel to the judge for several minutes, clearly explaining to him why it was important for that gospel message to continue going forth. And that judge had the opportunity to hear the gospel clearly presented. Gallio wouldn't. Gallio said, I'm not interested. I don't want to hear anything. You judge between yourselves these petty superstitions that you hold to. And notice verse 16, he drove them from the judgment seat. I want no part of your religious quarrel. You need to leave. And Paul didn't even have to defend himself. Now, when it says he drove them, uh, you might find this interesting. When it speaks of that, it speaks about the fact that they were physically driven out. Remember, Paul had received a uh, beating, many stripes, uh, by what I had told you they were called the lictors. They, they carried the rods, and he had, they beat him with it. That's what's happening here. The lictors there are driving them physically out, and those who were slow to leave were getting beat up, and he drives them out. So when this is happening, verse 17, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio took no notice of these things. Sosthenes received a flogging. They were just tired of these problems. Now, there was a man, I'll remind you, named Crispus, and he had been the synagogue officer, the official. But what happened is Crispus had come to faith in Christ and Sosthenes had replaced him. And it's more than likely that Sosthenes was the one who instigated the situation and because he more than likely was the one who did it, they took him and they beat him severely. And as you see then, if that's all we knew about Sosthenes, you'd say, yeah, you deserve that. But Sosthenes may have later come to faith in Christ. Now, why would we say that? Well, when Paul wrote the Corinthian church in his introduction in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1, this is how he opened it. He said, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. So it's possible that this man came to faith after these things had taken place. Now, as this is happening, Gallio, it says in verse 17, took no notice. He allowed it to take place, more than likely as a warning to others, there was a time when uh, justice could move sometimes quickly. And because justice moved quickly, the people would see the way they couldn't get away with doing something. Because a punishment for the crime would be immediate. That doesn't happen anymore. But it happened in the earlier days. And why did they have 
quick justice because it was a warning to others. So he's allowing this to take place. He took no notice of these things because he's warning the others this will happen to you too. As this happens, now remember the Lord had said that uh, I'm with you in verse 10. No one will attack you to hurt you. I have many people in this city. Because of that, Paul remains, verse 18, a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sancrea, for he had taken a vow. And so Paul had been told that he'd be safe. Don't remain silent. Now, some believe that Paul had been taken before Gallio after he had had that vision, and as a promise for his safety, his total time would have been around a year and a half. So he leaves, and in verse 18, he leaves and sails for Syria. So after a year and a half, it's time to go. Priscilla and Aquila were dear friends, and they went with him on this journey. Now, notice they went to a place called Sincrea. Well, You've got Corinth, and then off uh, uh, around 30 or 40 miles or so, I forget the exact distance, from, from Corinth, the city proper, there is a harbor, and it's a harbor called Sincrea. That's where they went. And notice, it, it, they went uh, to Sincrea, and then they took a ship to the city of Ephesus, which we're going to look at in just a moment. So that's a, that's a journey across uh, from Corinth to Ephesus that's around 240 miles. It says, while in Sincrea, he had shaved his head, because he had made a vow. Uh, the specific vow is not mentioned. He completed it, he shaved his head, and then he went all gangster with his bald head and little Pendleton and all of that, and he went to Ephesus. And they called him Little Paul at that time. <laughs> a little savage. But anyway. I don't know why I said that. Please don't judge me. It just comes out. In verse 19, he came to Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And so Ephesus is where he's going. Let me give you a little bit of information about this city. It was the main city in what it was then called Roman Asia. Ephesus is a city in Turkey. I've been there on a couple of occasions. It was a main city. It was a major marketplace located on a river called Kester. It was on the Aegean. By ancient standards, Ephesus was a huge city. It had a population of over 250,000. That's a huge city. It was a main center of Greek culture as well as heathen idolatry. Ephesus had well-paved ro uh, road streets. It had public buildings. It had a scientific center, a medical center. It had a huge library. It had a theater that seated 56,000 people. I've seen that theater, and they actually have uh, restored it, and they'll have concerts there at this restored theater. It was famous for its school of medicine, for its poets and philosophers. It was known for its fashion, but it was also known for its idolatry. Ephesus had the Temple of Diana, and the Temple of Diana is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a temple 425 feet long, 220 feet wide, and it was 60 feet high. It had 127 marble pillars, and 36 of which were overlaid with gold and jewels, and it housed an image of the multi-breasted fertility goddess Diana. Its economy was built on selling images of Diana, soothsaying, and the practice of magic. And Paul's come to this mighty, pagan, idolatrous city. And once again, he goes into the synagogue to preach. Verse 19 says, he came to Ephesus and he left them there. So he only had a short time. 
He left behind Aquila and Priscilla. We'll see them in a moment. And he entered, verse 19, the synagogue, once again reasoned with the Jews. So his love for his Jewish brethren drove him to reach out once again. He's been continuously rejected, hunted down, and treated terribly. And yet, he wants them to be saved. Well, in verse 20, they asked him to stay because he's reasoning there. He's communicating to them. They, they asked him to stay a longer time with them, but he wouldn't. He did not consent. He took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep, uh, keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. The openness of the gospel is reflected later in his ministry. There would be a church that was birthed. Godly elders would arise. Timothy would be its pastor. And Paul wrote a very powerful letter to the Ephesians. But sadly, later, it would receive another letter. But this time, it was from Jesus because they had left their first love. The book of Revelation, chapter 2, speaks concerning that to the church of Ephesus, right? And he speaks concerning Jesus. It's from Jesus. He speaks concerning all the good that they have done. And he speaks concerning those things, but then he says, but I have this thing against you. You have left your first love. So this is a church that is being birthed in front of us that would have a long history, but finally ends up receiving a letter from Jesus saying, you've walked away from me. You need to come back. Now they want him to stay, but he couldn't because he says, I have to go to Jerusalem. The spirit is leading me and I have to go. I want to be in Jerusalem more than likely for Pentecost. I need to meet with the leaders of the church, and so I can't remain. But God willing, I'll return. Now in verse 22, it says, when he had gone, when he had landed at Caesarea, that's in Israel, it's a port city in Israel, and gone up and greeted the church, he went down, he went to, to Antioch. That completes what has been referred to as his second missionary journey. And now verse 23 after he had spent some time there, he departed, went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. So he is rested, and now he departs on his third missionary journey. He's traveling to the northeast, and he's ministering, and he's strengthening various churches. And now we're going to be introduced to a man by the name of Apollos. Verse 24 a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside. And they explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had, who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so what we have now is I, this is a message that I chose to entitle the key the key to greatness. We're going to be looking at this young man, a man by the name of Apollos. Apollos, when you read scripture in his description here, was very impressive. He had what you would call a powerful resume. And what we're going to be looking at is the training of a man of God. Because this young man has great advantages and a lot of of potential. I want to describe them to you because I really believe we have much to learn, especially those of you who want to be used by God in a, in a, in a more powerful way. You know, on, on Monday nights, we, we, we are having a, a, a school of ministry, a school of discipleship. And I've been teaching uh, on Monday nights uh, some of the men in our church who, who want to know uh, ministry in a deeper way. And some of them want to plant churches. And this is a great example that everybody ought to follow, especially if you want to be used by the Lord. And I'm going to break this down for you and show you some things, hopefully to, to emphasize what I'm saying at this moment. This is the training of a man of God. Now, who is he? 
who is this man with such advantages? This man with so much potential. Now, that word potential is a word you don't like to use in ministry because very often what it means is you had potential and you didn't achieve it. You didn't meet it. You had such a potential for greatness, but, but, but because you, you failed to actually receive instruction to achieve that potential or to, to move into that direction, you were not used as well as you would have liked to have been used. And so what we're going to look at is, is the training of this man. I'll just give you a few things and begin that way. Notice how Luke tells us that he was Jewish. He was a Jewish man who had been uh, raised in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, during the time, there were about one million Jews who were living in Alexandria. And these Jews spoke Greek. And they had the Jewish scriptures that had been translated into Greek. And so with a large population like that, it was home to an enormous synagogue. So like Paul, he could communicate to both Jew and Gentile with equal effectiveness. And that is a tremendous advantage in ministry. If you have the ability to cross-culturally minister, that is a treat. You double your ministry. You have a greater amount of people you can reach. And this man had potential not to just read, uh, reach the Jewish people, because he was steeped in, we'll see this in Scripture, but he was also culturally able to, to speak to the Gentiles. He could teach them the things of the Lord because he understood their culture. And so this is a man who, who was well-trained and culturally able. Also, notice he was eloquent, the Scripture says, eloquent in speech, uh, it speaks of being skilled, skilled in literature, skilled in the arts, skilled in history, skilled in his capacity to speak. He was somebody who could speak in such a way as you would listen with great respect. You would listen to this man as he spoke. He didn't bore you. He would stir you. This was a guy who could speak well. When they spoke of Paul, they said, Paul was boring. The Corinthians said that. That was one of the accusations against him. He's a boring speaker. He's not a trained orator. But this young man was. This, this young man could speak well. He was rational. He was wise. He was impressive. And he was respectable. Alexandria was the second most important city in the Roman Empire. Alexandria was an educational center. It trained students in literature and philosophy. That meant that he had the background capable of engaging the intellectuals in religion and philosophy. So he's extremely impressive. He's eloquent. He's also culturally and socially sophisticated. Alexandria had a, what is called cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitan flavor to it. It was actually filled with various cultures. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to travel the world. Many in this room have, many listening more than likely have. If you had the opportunity to travel to other countries, you probably, before you go to the country and the city that you're traveling to, you may have a preconception of what that, what that city may be that you're going to. In 1975, I had the opportunity for the first time to go into Spain I traveled with a friend of mine throughout Europe for three months. We backpacked Europe. And we were in Barcelona. And when you, when you go in to the city and Madrid, when you go in, especially Barcelona, you may have this kind of image in your mind. That maybe you've seen movies, but you've never been there. But you picture it in a certain way. But the first time I ever went into Barcelona, I actually was very surprised. It's extremely extremely cosmopolitan. I mean, you go to Madrid, and Madrid is kind of the stereotype of what you might think of Spain, but, but it, Barcelona isn't. You go into the streets in Barcelona, and you'll find people from Africa, people from the Middle East. There are a lot of people from England. It's very cosmopolitan. And I was very surprised the first time I went there. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe I thought there'd be some bullfighters running around the city. I don't know. All I know is when I went in there, I, I made a mistake. I was looking for Mexican food. No, they haven't arrived. 
anyway, I'll get back to it. So when you, when you go there, you may have in your mind an idea of what you think Spain is going to be like. For me, I had in my mind what I thought, and it's not at all. You see all these cultures, and culture has a tendency of, uh, of blending and making a new kind of feel. That's cosmopolitan. That's how it was. So he had the ability to go into and minister into a huge city that was very cosmopolitan, but at the same time, uh, he wasn't really that impressed with it. You see, Ephesus was a home to the lighthouse of Alexandria. That was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built around 270 B.C. This, this lighthouse was 400 feet high, one of the tallest structures on earth. And you wonder about the ancient people, how they built this immense tower, but that lends itself to ministry because you're not easily impressed. You've seen what the world has to offer. When you go through 2 Timothy and you, you come to the conclusion, when Paul writes to the pastor, Timothy and all, you get to a point where he speaks concerning those who have remained faithful, and very few had, by the way. But Paul speaks concerning one of his fellow ministers, one of the men who were, was regarded by him. His name was Demas. And when he speaks of a guy named Demas, he says, Demas has forsaken me. He's abandoned me. And this is why he said, having loved this present age. I don't know exactly the details of this man, but it could be that he was a typical man of his day who had never been impressed by the amazing structures and architecture and ever heard the philosophies of the world and the articulation of those things. Whatever it was with Demas, Demas thought the world was more important than the one to come. In ministry... You have to be aware that there's a greater than what you're watching or looking at. And I don't say this in a weird way. Some people will probably think it, but I think that's one of the things that the Lord has used in my own life is because long before I was pastoring a church, I was in Paris. I, I was there, and I did see the uh, various sites in the city of lights that they have. I've had the opportunity of going into, uh, into Munich, into London, uh, I've had the chance to go into Madrid and, 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 and uh, Salzburg. And, I mean, I've been around, and, and I've seen a lot. And, and before I was the uh, pastor in the church, you, you see the impressive things, uh, the, the ancient, you know, in Rome, the ancient Colosseum, and the beautiful architecture and all of that. And, and you could be taken by that. But he wasn't. He was not, oh, I've got to someday go here and see this. He wasn't that guy. He, he was actually uh, raised in, a, in an amazing culture already. So Ephesus wasn't going to be a temptation for him whatsoever. And again, you know, Alexandria was a very impressive city. Ephesus isn't going to do anything to him. He's already sophisticated. Then it says concerning him that he was mighty in scriptures. He had been raised in Egypt, but he had received an in-depth instruction in the Old Testament. He was an expert. When it says mighty in scriptures, he was an expert in the reading and interpretation of the Old Testament writings. And that had made him open to the gospel, very much like uh, Timothy. When Paul said to Timothy from childhood, in 2 Timothy 3.15, from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He was familiar with the Old Testament. He was mighty in the scriptures and in, in, uh, he was saved in what would be called in the Old Testament way. You see, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, salvation is, is, is received by, by grace through faith in both the Old and the New. And so an Old Testament saint could be a believer and go to heaven because he was looking forward to Messiah being revealed. The New Testament believer is saved because he looks back to when the Messiah had been revealed. So this was one who was looking forward to 
the revelation, and you'll see this in a moment, of Messiah. So he had the Old Testament approach and faith. And so he was somebody who was very, very uh, filled with the understanding of these things. He was open to the message. And then also, verse 25 says, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So that means he had a basic understanding of the mission of John the Baptist. He knew of the baptism of repentance, and he knew that John had come proclaiming the Messiah who was to come. And so he knew that, but he did not know the death of Jesus. He did not know the resurrection of Christ. He did not know Pentecost, the sending of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have that understanding. All he had, and it says here, that he, he, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he had insufficient understanding. It's also said that he was fervent in spirit. He spoke and he taught accurately the things of the Lord. Fervent in spirit. He was passionate. He was powerful. He spoke and he taught the things that he taught accurately. He was a diligent man, a student of the word of God. So these are the things that we're looking at as we're looking at this man. Now remember, Paul had laid the foundation, but he had left for ministry. He left behind a couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Shortly thereafter, Apollos enters. He begins to share the little that he knows in the synagogue. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So Aquila and Priscilla heard him, and they took him aside, and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Aquila and Priscilla, I picture them, doesn't say how old they, they were, but they're older than he is. They're an older couple. And they hear him. They're in the synagogue. And here comes this young man, and he begins to, with fire, speak concerning the baptism of John and the coming of Messiah. And that had already taken place many years before. And they're listening Messiah's already been here, and they're listening, and they see he's incomplete in his knowledge. And when they see this, they take him aside privately, and they teach him. Now, his response reveals one of the most important earmarks of a man of God, because when he was instructed, even corrected, he had the humility to receive further instruction. And that is precisely where many young and promising ministers fail most often. They think that because they have an audience, they're very anointed, and they fall prey to pride and the danger of outward success. The audience believes them. They say he's very anointed, and they praise this young man. But because their understanding is not yet complete, they can begin to preach error. But because people continue coming and listening, error becomes accepted as truth. Now remember, he was educated, he's eloquent, he's cultured, he's religious, he's passionate, he's courageous. And on the weight of his charisma and zeal, his ministry would be a hit. They like this guy. They like what he's saying. They like the passion that he speaks with. They enjoy everything he's saying. Many believers make choices on whom they listen to based on the sincerity and likability of the speaker. And many young pastors who have succumbed to this have succumbed to what would be the trap of pride. And sadly, congregations sometimes even encourage that in the young man. A key to spiritual growth is humility and the ability to receive instruction. In Proverbs 18, verse 2, a fool has no delight in understanding, but, it, but in expressing his own heart. So you've got Aquila and Priscilla. They're in the synagogue. They're listening to him speak, and you can almost see them exchange a glance. We need to talk to this young guy. We need to take him aside. 
They're there in the synagogue, verse 26. And so, as they're there, Apollos comes in for the service. He boldly begins to share with the people. They're listening to him as he's teaching. But as mature believers, they begin to be concerned with his content. So what did they do? Did they interrupt him as he's speaking? Did they stand up and say, hey, come on, man. You're wrong. No, they, 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 they waited and privately approached him afterwards. One of the Calvary pastors was preaching, true story, he was preaching a Sunday morning. And he shared something. And his wife was sitting in the front row. And she said, that's not right. She yelled at him. That's not right. And I told Marie, honey, don't do that again. But she said, that's not right. And she had a little study, her study Bible, and she read the footnote there in the study Bible. This is what that means. No, you, you never, ever correct somebody that way. Uh, it, it's, it's, because what happens? Well, your, your pride, the pride of the person can well up. It's a, really an exceptional person who can be corrected like that without yielding a little bit, at least to his own flesh. Because there's a wise way in speaking, and then there's the unwise way. And sometimes people will want to correct you immediately, rather than waiting for that moment where you can have a conversation, and then it can be brought up in a gracious way. Excuse me, you were sharing something. Yeah, I was sharing that. Um, could I ask you a question? Yeah, look at When you said this, were you saying this? Yeah. Have you considered this? Now, a person who, who is humble will listen to correction. You don't correct people in front of other people. Any married couple in here knows that's not a good thing to do. That's a private conversation. That's the kind of thing you should do privately. You know, you said this today, and... I was wondering, and that's how you do it, with humility, not with the, I have to tell you. So you've got Aquila and Priscilla, they're, they're in synagogue, they're listening to this young man, this fervent, intellectual, well-respected preacher, and, and they're, they're thinking, no, this young man needs to be corrected. A key to growing is the humility that is required to do that. They took him aside. In Proverbs 1, verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase learning, a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Sometimes young men think because people like them, and oh, he's one of my favorite speakers, that, uh, that he's just all that. I was teaching at a pastor's conference in another city, in another state, a few years ago. I was sitting in the front row because I was the next speaker. This particular church where it was being held has a platform that has about eight steps that go to the top. It's, it's actually a lot higher. And so this young man, I'm sitting right in the front. Marie and I are. I'm the next speaker. And this young man speaks, and he's, he's very eloquent. He's very likable. You know, he's got humor, and people listen to him and, and all of that. He's got a good work that he's doing, and I'm listening to him. And then he says, well, he says something like this. He goes, well, let's just be honest. And he's speaking to us pastors. He says, let's just be honest. You're old. I said, hey, what? No, he said, <laughs> let's be honest. You're old. And I, I, I thought, well, okay, okay. So I, it was my turn next to come and speak. So I go walking up the steps, and like I said, it's about twice as high as these here, so it's about eight to ten steps up. And I walked to behind the pulpit, and I stood just like this, and I said, let me catch my breath. I said, after all, I'm old. And everybody kind of chuckles along with me. But that's the attitude Apollos didn't have. He didn't have that, I'm all that, get out of the way. I remember at one of our pastor's conferences many years ago, uh, when we had uh, Pastor Chuck had gone to heaven and it was our first pastor's conference after his uh, home going that it was posted on uh, social media about the older pastors who were speaking and it said something about had to listen to these dinosaurs. And there's an attitude 
that the young can have. Instead of learning from the elders who've been there, done that, already know that, they want to just get you out of the way so they can do it the way it should be done with a failure to understand that you have all that you have now because of faithful men who'd gone before you to do the work that produced that ministry. And they don't see it. There's this attitude, I am telling you, that just get out of the way. We've got things to do. We want to do something. And then they go out and they hire juggling monkeys and they entertain the people. Oh, we've got a crowd, but a crowd isn't a church. It's just a crowd. And a lot of churches are actually crowds being entertained by entertainers who are not telling them the complete truth of the gospel. And the younger pastors, and by the way, I'll be teaching this particular message more fully at a pastor's conference in the East Coast pretty soon. I'm going to teach this to the younger pastors. Rather than saying, get out of the way, maybe you ought to say, how can I become better? Nobody says that you have to duplicate what the past is. But you certainly should build on a strong foundation. And you bring it up to where it is now. But you don't disregard the older. You have respect for them because God has used them and can teach you much. I asked this question once. Would you rather go to a doctor who just finished going through medical school? Or would you rather go to a doctor who's got 20, 25 years of experience in medical school? And then practice. Which would you rather go to? And one young lady yelled out, I'll go to both. That's kind of what today's like. I'll go to both. Now, if you ask me who I'm going to listen to, it's the one with experience. It's the one who knows that the things that the young man has not learned yet, the old man can instruct him in. Get out of the way. Let him do it. So you've got these older people sitting there listening, and this man's got so much potential. Now, the word potential is not a good word to be used in, in a person's life because very often you don't reach it. This man has much potential, but he needs to be instructed more thoroughly. It says, again, he began to speak boldly. He had the courage. Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside, explained to him the way of God more accurately. So they took him aside. And that's the key to being used greatly by the Lord. In Proverbs 9, 8 and 9, do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man. He will love you. Give instruction to a wise man. He'll be still wiser. Teach a just man. He will increase in learning. When you come here to this fellowship, I'm aware of the fact that if I just quote things out of memory, I can do that, but should I do that? That eventually what I do is I take the place of what the Word of God says. That's why I quote Scripture. That's why I'll say Proverbs 1, 9, or I'll say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, or John 16, whatever. I will quote that for you out of Scripture. Why? Because what happens, and I've seen this, is that sometimes that man who's preaching becomes the authority, and he actually is overshadowing the Scripture. So when you stand up and you say things like, well, it says in Scripture, well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Where does it say that? I want to be able to proof text you. I want to be able to read that for myself to see that it actually says that, because I've seen that. When you have eloquence and you have confidence and when you have courage and you have a testimony, the people have a tendency of, of looking to you rather than the word. When you have that pulpit personality where you can walk around and, and engage people and all oh, that, that's wonderful. I can't do that. I'm anchored here. I can't do that. But I don't want you looking to me. I want you looking to him. I want you to look to the word of God. And that's the reason I give you the scripture. Now, some people don't want to hear it. Don't oh, just tell me, no, I can't do that. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm not called to give you my opinion. I'm called to give you the word. And the word of God says such and so. So what we have here is a model. You have a, a model of spiritual maturity. Again, many times people who are younger think they've arrived. They don't need anything else. Look at all the people who are coming and listening to me. Well, Proverbs 19, verse 20 says, listen to counsel, receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. 
Oh, well, it doesn't matter to me now. That's not something that I'm going through now. No, but when you receive it as a young person, you'll be prepared when you are engaged by it. Oh, I don't have that. It's kind of like stages of marriage. You get married and, and everything is this, you know, roses and butterflies and, you know, running slowly across fields towards one another with angels. Then you get married. <laughs> and you're taught in premarital things. Look out for this. Look out for that. Be aware of this. That'll never happen to me. That's other people who aren't as in love <laughs> as we are. I, 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 I've said this before, but I remember when I did premarital, I'd say, I'd say this. This is the question. I would say to the young couple, I would say, every Every per, the person you're in love with and you're about to marry, uh, there are many things about them that make you uh, have love for them. And they always, they'd sit there holding hands and they'd turn and look at each other and kind of nod, you know. I'd say, but let me ask you something. What is it about them you don't like? How dare you question our love? <laughs> what is it? This is, this is true. I would look at the guy. What is it about her that you don't like? I, I don't remember ever one of them saying anything. Because guys don't think. <laughs> it's true. What, do you, what is it about her you don't like? Oh, no. She's great. What are you going to want to change? Oh, nothing. <laughs> then I'd look at her. What is it about him that you're going to want to change? She goes to her purse, pulls out a list. <laughs> and we're there for two hours. <laughs> See, so you, you, you can enter into thinking you've arrived. And then you have the older person who says, been there, done that. These are things to be aware of. That's you. Because your love is not as intense as ours. Okay, Romeo. Uh, <laughs> young ministers can be the same way. You're just jealous. I've got a parking lot filled with cars. And you have a handful of people you share with. You're just jealous. Everybody says everything I say really strikes their heart. You're just jealous. Get out of the way. Let the new wave arrive. You don't know how to reach this generation. Look at I'm an older man. I admit it, and I'm grateful for every day God gives to me to live a little bit longer. I'm very grateful for it. But I can tell you, I was young once, and I know that. I know those things where I've been corrected by an elder, and I've said that's just because you don't know. And then later, I've discovered what he already knew to my own hurt. Apollos was not that man. When these people took him aside, he listened. Remember, Aquila was not a theologian. Aquila was a tent maker. This old couple sitting there listening took him aside. But he listened. But he listened. The zealous eloquent, passionate man listened and was benefited by it. And so was the body of Christ. And finally, verse 27, when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. He got letters of recommendation. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. He has learned what the grace of God is in salvation. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He is now capable of doing that. With the added knowledge that he's gained from these old saints, he went beyond the introductory ministry of John the Baptist. He now knows that Jesus Christ came, that the prophecy spoken of him had been fulfilled, that he walked the face of the earth, that he did miracles, taught certain things, was placed on a cross, was buried, died, was resurrected the third day. He ascended into heaven after the 40th day. He sent the Holy Spirit. Now he knows these things. And now he's got a complete message to give. And it was because he was willing to be taught. 
and he vigorously refuted the Jews openly. He was greatly used, and he became a very powerful preacher of the gospel of grace. May God help us to have the humility of an Apollos.